Previously, the text-to-speech was damning the Swedish language for tying it up in pretzels trying to pronounce the word Sverige correctly. Now I'm speaking in English over a microphone, I can mess it up in all sorts of new and interesting ways. Anyway. The coastal defence battleship was a product of the ironclad and dreadnought age up until about the 1920s. The vast number of purpose-built ships of this type were made for countries that either could not afford or did not need full-scale ocean-going battleships, but might need to defend themselves from enemy battleships or cruisers. Generally, these ships possessed the same kind of main battery as contemporary capital ships, as well as similar armour in the larger cases, but they were slower, of shallower draft, and generally had a smaller or non-existent secondary armament. Although they would be at a disadvantage in a fight against a regular battleship in the open ocean, in their chosen environment they would be able to negotiate shallow water that other ships of their armament couldn't, and therefore they could exploit the local terrain to maximum advantage. The Sveria class were one of the largest and best equipped examples. Being designed and built at a time when dreadnoughts were coming into service, they didn't quite fully reflect the developments of the larger powers, but at just under 8,000 tonnes displacement there was no way you could reasonably have expected them to do so. The class consisted of three ships, the Sveria, the Drottning Victoria and the Gustav V. The previous classes had been armed with only a pair of 8-inch guns, which was no threat to the modern dreadnoughts of Britain and Germany, and so these new ships were a big step up. Although the main belt was somewhat thinner than dreadnoughts, at about 8 inches thick, this still left them some better protected than some battle cruisers, and the armament consisted of four 11-inch guns in a pair of twin turrets, with one at each end, along with a secondary battery of eight 6-inch guns, which were all in turrets, which was a technological achievement at the time for secondary batteries. These were arranged in three single turrets on either side, and a twin turret superfiring over the forward 11-inch turret. Four 75mm and a pair of 57mm anti-aircraft guns, along with a couple of machine guns and a pair of torpedo tubes, completed the overall armament. The Swedish government selected the design as the most powerful from a whole variety of options, but then an election brought in a new government which decided to postpone the funding. The Swedish people then rallied behind the king and supplied the funding for the first ship themselves, which then forced the government to step down and a third government to form, which would then order the ship in 1912, named Sverige for Sweden as a whole. Three years later, the two additional ships were ordered, which were named after the king and queen of Sweden. These ships would be built to a slightly different design that allowed them to be better operated as icebreakers. Since the ships came into service toward the end of the First World War, they didn't accomplish much in this period, but in the 1920s and 1930s they were modernised to use oil fuel for a speed of 23 knots, along with the removal of the torpedo tubes and a considerable portion of the ship's secondary battery in favour of numerous 8, 20, 25 and 40mm anti-aircraft guns. This period also allowed for the evolution of the tactics that would be used in the event of war. Essentially, the ships would form a battle group sailing together, along with smaller craft such as cruisers, destroyers, torpedo boats and mine layers, as well as submarines and aircraft. Operating from shallow coastal waters, this force would be far stronger than any raiding cruiser or other lesser ship, and a battleship or battle cruiser would find itself limited in mobility in the shallow water, and therefore subject to swarming attacks by the smaller Swedish vessels, whilst also having to deal with 12 11-inch guns coming in from three separate sources. Although their slower speed would mean that something like a Scharnhorst or Renown could pick the fleet apart at range in the open ocean, Sweden wasn't planning on invading anyone else, so that particular scenario didn't actually matter. This was all put to the test when the Second World War broke out. Germany swiftly invaded Norway and Denmark, whilst Finland was semi-allied due to a mutual dislike of Russia, and that left Sweden as the last Scandinavian state that was still vaguely free, but it was sitting on a lot of natural resources that Hitler really wanted. However, Sweden was never invaded and after the war declassified German plans seemed to indicate that one of the major reasons was that an army in Sweden would have to be supplied by sea, and the German navy was not confident that it had the forces at hand to maintain sea superiority over the Swedish navy. Whilst a lot of German ships were tied up trying to hurt the British and other allied navies, this consideration appears to indicate that the deterrent effect of the Sveria class was highly effective. 
Sperrier herself, along with Drottning Victoria, would remain in service until the late 1950s, whilst although Gustav V was taken out of service at the same time, it would not be scrapped until the 1970s. That's it for this video. Thanks for watching. If you have a comment or suggestion for a ship to review, let us know in the comments below. Don't forget to comment on the pinned post for dry dock questions.